Today, we will start with a keynote lecture. Uh, we are very pleased at uh, the NIA to have uh, two uh, guest lecturers today, Dr. Carmen Ivanez Guza and Dr. Vicente Albero. Uh, they are uh, both uh, part of the Concrete Science and Technology Institute, ECTEC. And uh, today, they will give uh, a lecture on modeling structures and fires and give a general overview based on the error code. So uh, we are very pleased to, uh, to welcome them today. And uh, Carmen will be the first uh, to start, followed by uh, Vicente. So I'm going to make Carmen present. Uh, so the, the floor is yours, uh, Carmen. OK, so good afternoon to everyone. Um, as I said, my name is Carmen Ibáñez, and I am from Universidad Politécnica of Valencia. And me and my colleague, Vicente Alvero, we are very pleased of having been invited to participate in this session. And we are going to do the next presentation entitled Modeling Structures in Fire, a general overview based on Eurocodes. This is the outline that we are going to, to follow. Uh, after an introduction, we move to the fire model section. And after that, we'll see the heat transfer model section and the mechanical model section. I will start with the first two points and then my colleague will continue with the third and fourth uh, point. Well, as we all know, um, modeling and structuring fire involves three steps. Uh, fire modeling is like uh, the first uh, one, which involves the selection of the fire scenario, I'm going to take a laser, of the proper fire scenario and the determination of the reference temperature time Q. In fact, the objective of this step is to obtain this uh, T sub G, uh, which is the temperature of the gas that is going to heat the structure. Once the temperature of the gas is obtained, the next step will be uh, the thermal analysis, which implies the calculation of the temperature evolution within the structural members. And finally, the structural analysis with the calculation of the mechanical behavior of the uh, structure that is exposed to fire. Well, um, Eurocode 1, part 1 2, uh, says that a full analytical procedure for a structural fire design um, is able to take into account all uh, these uh, points here the behavior of the structural system, the potential heat exposure, the beneficial effects of the active and passive fire protection systems, and uh, even the consequences of fire. Um, all these are if all these uh, points are considered explicitly, it will be a performance-based design. However, Eurocode 1 um, considers two alternative design approach, uh, procedures or approaches, as we can see here in the figure. The first difference uh, between them lays in the way the thermal action is considered. As we can see here, the prescriptive approach uh, uses nominal fires to generate thermal actions, whereas the performance-based design um, refers to thermal actions based on physical and chemical parameters. It is worth to mention that when uh, the prescriptive approach is used, the classification system, which calls for specific periods of fire resistance, as all we know, 30, 60 minutes, takes into account uh, the features and uncertainties described in the slide before, uh, but not explicitly. Focusing on how to model the thermal action, two main um, groups of temperature time cures can be found. First, we have here the nominal temperature time cures, which will be used when we are um, using a prescriptive approach, and the natural temperature time cure groups, which we we'll use when a performance-based design or approach is used. Let's see, therefore, the options that we have to define this thermal action. It says, let's move now to see the fire, how to define the fire models according to the proper fire scenario. Let's start with, um, with an overview reviewing the stages of a fire in a compartment in absence of fire control, when we have all the stages that we can find in a fire. So we can see here the fire will start with the ignition, 
And at first, the fire grows primarily as a function of the fuel itself, with no influence uh, of the compartment at all. Uh, and if, uh, if there are um, sufficient fuel and oxygen in the compartment, the fire will continue to grow and the temperature in the compartment will rise. Uh, there's a point we will find a phenomenon called the flash over, which is a transition from a growing fire to a fully developed um, fire, in which all the combustible items in the compartment are involved in, uh, are involved in fire. We can see that this phenomenon starts around 500, 600 uh, degrees. After the flash over, we have this stage, which is the, the moment of the, the fully developed fire. And uh, during this stage is when the heat release rate is the highest um, uh, of all the phases. And in this, in this stage, the fire behavior is influenced by the conditions of the compartment, the materials, the ventilation. And um, finally, we have the decay phase that occurs as the fuel becomes consumed. Well, let's start with the first group of uh, curves, which are the nominal temperature time curves. These curves are um, representative curves expressed usually through a mathematical formula, which usually have no direct relationship to the characteristics of the building considered. In general, these curves are used for testing passive uh, protection materials, for classifying products uh, of construction, etc. Maybe all of us uh, know this curve, the standard temperature time curve, ISO 834, which is used internationally for fire resistant testing of components. It does not depend on the fire lower or the ventilation conditions of the compartment, and it can be used exclusively for post flash over fires. As we can see, the curve is always growing with time, so it does not correspond to any real fire. In this slide, we can see the comparison of the ISO uh, 834 cure with a cure that has all the stages, a fire cure with all the stages. As we can see, the ISO 834 starts in the moment of the flash over. Um, well, as we have said before, this cure is internationally used for furnace tests. And because it consists of a single ever-increasing heating phase, um, using it for testing is very practical because it ensures here we have it ensures uh, that failure will always occur, and that allows the classification of uh, the products, etc. And also, given that the uh, the only parameter to control is the temperature of fire, that makes easy to control the furnace environment. Another curve that we can find is the hydrocarbon fire curve. As uh, we have seen in the ISO here, we have the formula that defines this curve. And um, obviously, this curve uh, represents the effects of a uh, hydrocarbon type fire and has uh, its main application on chemical and petrochemical industries. A third group that we can find is uh, for external fire, the external fire curve. Uh, its use is intended for the outside of separating external walls, which can be exposed to fire from different parts of the facade, uh, either directly from the inside of the respective fire compartment or from a compartment situated either below or adjacent to the respective external wall. The last nominal temperature curve that we are presented here is the, the tunnel uh, experimental cure, the RWS, which uh, was developed by the Transport Ministry from um, the Netherlands. Uh, the fact that is that the, the more severe fire scenarios detected in tuners highlighted the necessity of a new curve uh, for the evaluation of the passive fire protection material in tuners. So here we have this cure that we can see that reached higher temperatures than the, the previous one. Well, once we have, we have seen this quick uh, review to the nominal temperature curves, which are the easiest ones, let's move to uh, 
the section where we are going to see how to obtain natural temperature jam curves, um, which are always derived from uh, the development of natural fire scenarios through models, either simplified or advanced models. As we have commented before, these models can be considered explicitly the fire load, the heat release rate, the ventilation, the properties of the compartment or the thermal properties of the materials. Depending on the particular um, approach, we can even consider the influence of the uh, fire suppression installations, for example, the sprinklers or the uh, fire team's actions that can act. We'll start reviewing two concepts. Uh, first, we are going to see the concept of fire load, and secondly, we will review the concept of heat release rate. Let's just start with the fire load. And first, we, we will see some definitions just to, to share you know, the concept. Well, when we're in a compartment fire, we can say that the fire load density is the fire load per unit area related to the floor area. In this case, we will have this QF or related to the surface area of the total enclosure, including openings. In this case, we have this QR. In the same way, the fire load, not density, the fire load, is the sum of the thermal energies which are released by combustion of all the combustible materials in a space. Um, for calculation, a design value should be used. Here we have the expression that Eurocode um, gives for the calculation of the a design value of this fire load density. Let's see if it, each of them. Well, first we have here a, a factor M, which um, well is a coefficient that depends on the type of fuel. Usually it's taken at 0 0.8 for a cellulosic material. Then we have this delta Q1 and delta Q2, which are um, fire activation risk factors that depends on the compartment area, delta Q1, and on the occupancy of the compartment, delta Q2. Here we have a table E1 from Eurocode that gives us the value of these factors according, as I said, with the floor area of the compartment of the type of uh, occupancy. The next value we need to set is the um, characteristic fire low density, QFK, which is given again by, in this case, table E4 from Eurocode 1, uh, according to the um, type of occupancy that we have in our design. Uh, usually, the 80% fractal is, uh, is employed in the calculation. It's important to mention that also the characteristic fire load can also be obtained considering all the uh, combustible items, materials, and the net calorific values and, uh, and mass that we have in the compartment. And the last factor that we can find is this delta N, which is um, a factor taking into account the different active fighting measures imposed by um, safety reasons. The values again are given in this table, in this case table E2, uh, and we can find different values according to the, um, the different uh, active fire fighting measures that we can find. Automatic fire suppression, fire detection, manual fire suppression. The final value of delta sub n is obtained by multiplying the different factors. Well, once we have seen this review of uh, how to calculate, how to obtain this fire load according to Eurocode, Let's review the concept of heat release rate. The heat release rate that we can find with uh, these capital letters, HRR, also we can find uh, RHR as, uh, as in the Eurocode. Um, we can find all these in, in the literature, the, the three of them. Is the energy released by a combustible product as a function of time. The um, heat release rate can be obtained with uh, the cone calorimeters or the hood, as we can see here. But for compartments, Eurocode 1 uh, gives us already um, the value of these curves, uh, establishing the, um, the value of certain parameters for different types of occupancies, as we have here. 
Eurocode can define these um, curves, establishing, as I said, uh, different parameters, the growth rate, the RHR per unit area, and the area of the compartment. Well, here we have like, two slides showing how these curves, the HRR curves, can be obtained experimentally. Here on the left, we have a figure um, where we can see a hood um, measuring the concentration of the gases extracted from um, a test. Here we can see a product burning, the hood extract the gases, and then these gases are measured and through the analysis of the concentration, these curves can be derived. Here we have like an example of like different tests uh, carry out a, work, a workstation, a mattress with the corresponding uh, curve. And here on top we have the facilities of uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, uh, from where these images and tests have been taken. Here in the second slide, the same. We have here a figure of um, a big hood where these tests can be can be accomplished. And here the test of a car and the corresponding uh, heat uh, release rate cube. Well, these cubes, as we can see, with all this noise and peaks, are experimental curves. However, Eurocode one uh, gives for different types of occupancy of occupancy. Sorry. <clears throat> um, uh, empirical curves with different values. Sorry. So um, here we have um, a growing phase in this curve, a plateau, and then a decay phase. The growing phase can be defined with the expression that we have here. And uh, this expression, as you, you can see, depends of a um, parameter, which is T alpha. T alpha is, um, is the time um, needed to reach a rate heat release of one megawatt. In table E4, E5, sorry, that we have here, we can see how this value is established for different types of occupancies and that together with the value of this T alpha, the fire growth uh, rate of the fire is, defi is defined. We have here, for example, for dwelling a medium growth rate, for theater fast, etc. And that goes according to the value of this T alpha. As we can see here, the growing phase is limited by an horizontal plateau that corresponds to the stationary state and uh, corresponds to a value uh, RHR max, which is given by the product of the RHR sub F, which is the maximum rate of heat release produced by one square meter of fire, and that is given also in table E5 according to the occupancy. If we know the area of the fire, with, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, the maximum is always the fire compartment area, we can obtain the value of this plateau. This horizontal plateau is limited by this decay phase that is linear and that starts when the 70% of the fire load have, has been burned. I mean, when we have the area enclosed by the curve up to this point, if we have here the vertical, is the 70% of the fire load. In that moment, the decay phase starts. Here in this slide, we can see in pink the RHR cure when the fire is fuel controlled, when we don't have problems with the ventilation. However, if the ventilation is limited, we have a type of cure like the red one, and the fire is called ventilation control. As we can see here, the plateau level has to be reduced from here to here, following the available oxygen, oxygen content. <coughs> This can be done automatically by a computer pro program. Later, we'll see some programs that uh, also are able to simulate uh, localized fire. Or using the simplified expression here, so in red, that is given by the Eurocode. Also, we have to take into account 
that in the case of a ventilation control fire, the red one, the cure of the rate heat release has to be extended to correspond um, to the available energy given by the fire load. At the end, the area enclosed by both cures, by the pink one or the red one, has to be the same if they belong to the same compartment with the same fire load. Once we have reviewed these two concepts, the fire load and the uh, rate of um, uh, heat release, we can pass to review the different uh, models, simplified or advanced, that can be used to obtain this natural temperature time cures uh, of a defined scenario for a performance based design. Let's start with the simplified models. And uh, the first type that we can find, or that we are going to explain here, are the parametric curves, defined also by Eurocode 1. These curves uh, are um, for engulfed fires in compartments, and um, the gas temperature in the environment of the member surface is given as a function of time and on basis of fire models and physical parameters defining the conditions in the fire compartment. As we can see here, the model uh, has limitations, it's, it's valid only for fire compartments up to 500 square meters, with an openness on the roof, and with a maximum height of 4 meters. Since these are natural fire curves, the factors that we can see here are explicitly taken into account in the definition of the curves. The total area of the compartment, the openings that exists, the fire load, the uh, characteristics of the wall materials. Here we can see the letter uh, with uh, which we identify these factors in the expressions of the curve. The parametric curves are defined by two stages, a growing phase up to a time max that we can see here, and a cooling phase that usually is linear. The expression for the growing phase is shown here. This is the one given by the Eurocode, and is written in terms of a modified time that depends on a gamma factor. This gamma factor considers the ventilation of the compartment here with the letter O and the compartment properties here with the letter B. As we can see here in the big figure, if gamma is more than one, the parametric cure, the one in blue, hits faster than the ISO 834 that is drawn here as a reference. If gamma is less than one, this is happening here in the small figure on the uh, right bottom, the opposite happens. The parametric cure hits uh, slower than the ISO 834. In case of gamma equal to one, the equation of the parametric cure approximates, or is the same, that the standard temperature time cube is the same as the ISO 834. The growing phase, as we have said, finish when the Tmax is reached. Tmax depends on the fire load and on the um, ventilation of the compartment. This time, Tmax, as we can see here, is limited by a time limit, which is a function of the time of growth rate. Here we can say for the slow fire growth, medium fire growth, or fast fire growth. The introduction of this time limit in the expression is to avoid fires that are uh, excessively short when the relation between the fire load and the, and the opening factor here, the fire load and the opening factor, decreases. It obeys to the fact that any object needs certain time to burn, even when the oxygen is unlimited. So the Tmax will always be the maximum of these two values. And finally, we have the, the cooling phase. Um, for which linear behavior is, is assumed according to these uh, expressions here on the, on the right. Well, so the parametric fires, per, sorry, the parametric cubes are for engulfed fires in compartments. Now we are going to see um, simplified models to obtain the temperature cure for localized fires. The thing is that when flashover is unlikely to occur, 
this generali generalized and fully developed fire, when this is unlikely to occur, a model for localized fire should be adopted. Since only a limited area of the fire compartment is, um, is involved in this fire. Uh, the um, models for localized fire consider, among others, the next parameters, the diameter of the fire, the rate of heat release, the flame height, or the distance between the fire source and the ceiling. We have two models. We use one or another depending on if the flame has reached the ceiling. Here on the left, we see this figure, and we can see that the flame of the fire is not impacting the ceiling. In this case, LF is less than H, which is the compartment height. However, we can find the case when the flame is impacting the ceiling. The flames has reached the ceiling, and we have the situation where, obviously, the um, LF is higher than H. What happens when the flame is not impacting the ceiling? In this case, we will use the Heskestats model. Uh, here we have the expressions for the temperature of the um, the, the temperature of the um, sorry <laughs> the temperature of the plume of the fire, and here the temperature uh, the expression for the flame length L. The opposite situation is when the flame is impacting the ceiling. In this case, we have to switch to the Hasemis model, a model that is uh, in purpose for uh, situations of this case. And in, in this case here, we have the way the uh, heat flows received by the fire exposed unit surface area at the level of the ceiling is obtained. These are the expressions, as I said before, uh, given by Eurocode 1 in uh, the Annex C. On the fire exposed surfaces, the need heat flux uh, should be determined by considered heat transfer by convection and radiation. As we'll see later, uh, software can be used to easily modelize a uh, localized fire. We will see the program Ozone that is able to, to reproduce this type of models, uh, but also the expressions of, that we have available in Annex C of Eurocode 1, uh, part 1 2, can be, can be obtained. Finally, to uh, finish with the section of simplified models, we are going to see some uh, proposals given by different authors that we can find in literatures for uh, uh, the estimation of the temperatures in compartment fires. These proposals that involve like hand calculations or on programming, um, as I said, uh, uh, we can find a lot of them. Here, as an example, we have mentioned some of them, like the method of McCaffrey, Quintile, and Hacker row or the method of Food, Pang, and Alvarez. But um, my recommendation is to check the chapter 30 from the SFP Handbook of Fire Protection Engineering, which has a very nice recopilation of four different methods, uh, difference between them. Um, uh, applications, etc. Once we have uh, seen the simplified models, let's review, as the last part of this uh, section, the second category, the, the advanced models, that also allow to obtain these natural cures uh, with a specific zone. Let's start with the zone models. Um, the calculation methods available nowadays include iterative procedures, which require, as I said before, the use of a specific software. Some models are used for the evaluation of the temperature development of the gases within a compartment during the course of a fire. Um, it is necessary to highlight one of the most widely known uh, uh, models, as I said before, Ozone, developed by the University of Leeds. Um, it's a code that includes a two-zone model and one-zone model. Here we can see the figures, a two-zone model. We can see clearly these two zones in which the compartment is divided. Later we will go more into it, or one-zone model. And it's possible to switch from a two-zone model to one-zone model uh, when some criteria are met. This program, Ozone, uh, deals with localized fires. As I said before, we can 
we can use this type of programs to simulate this localized fire and also uh, deals with fully engulfed fires in a company. Let's, uh, let's see the um, characteristics of the two zone model. A two-zone model is a five model where different zones are defined in a compartment. Here in the figure, we can see the upper layer, the lower layer, the fire and its plume, and the external gas and uh, the walls. In each layer, the gas properties are uniform. Also, the pressure is constant in the whole compartment. The layers are separated by an adiabatic horizontal plane. Here we you can see at height ZS, and is uh, only connected by an air entrain model, the two, the two layers. As we can see in the figure, the upper layer is opaque, and the upper layer partitions, which are the wall and the ceiling, are connected to, uh, to the layer by radiation in convection. On the other hand, the lower layer is clear and is partitioned Again, the wall and the floor are connected to the layer only in this case by convection. On the other hand, we have the one zone model. We can imagine that when we are modeling a real fire and we are we are modeling the transition for the growing fire to the fully developed fire, we are going through this flashover that makes that the, the fire is generalized in the whole compartment. In this case, uh, the model to be adopted is a one zone model where homogeneous temperatures of the gas are assumed in the compartment. In this case, in the model that ozone pro uh, proposes. The compartment is represented by a single zone where temperature and density are uniform, and again, the pressure is constant in the whole compartment volume. The zone is supposed to be opaque. We can see here with gray all the, the single zone of all the compartment. And the partitions, walls, ceiling, floor, are connected to it by radiation and convection. Because here we have all these hot gases that also uh, allow for uh, the radiation uh, phenomenon. Well, the fire here on the floor is um, defined by its rate mass loss, the rate of heat release, and the area. And all the mass and energy coming from the fire are added to this single zone. As commented before, in the program Ozone, uh, some requirements need to be met in order to switch from one, sorry, from two zone model to a one zone model. Here, let's see. We can switch from the situation where we have two layers to the situation where we have one single zone. Um, in order to accomplish this, we can model this transition, uh, and we have four criteria to be able to switch from, as I said, the two-zone model to one-zone. Let's review this criteria. The first one, criterion one, here we have this figure, is achieved with the high temperature of the upper layer gases, here T sub U, um, leads to a flashover. Usually in the model, this is set to a temperature of 500 um, degrees. As we have commented before, in the stages of the of a fire, that was more or less the moment 500, 600 degrees when a flashover is modeled to, to occur. The second criterion, criterion C2, here we have it. Well, what, uh, what this criterion says is, uh, is that if the gas is in contact, sorry, if the gas is in contact with the fuel <clears throat> have higher temperature than the emission temperature of the fuel, here T in. The propagation of fire will occur in this case by convective uh, emission. So here we have several parameters. The, the um, upper layer is touching some of the combustible, and also the temperature of this layer is higher than the uh, convective emission temperature. The value usually taken for this is 300, uh, 300 degrees. Criterion C3. Here on this figure, uh, this criterion is achieved when the interface height goes down and leads to a very, very, very small lower layer thickness, which is not representative anymore of a two zone phenomenon because it's uh, really thin. 
Usually in the models it's assumed that the height of um, the height of this upper layer, this ZS, um, is less than the 20% of the height. When that happens, this criterion activates. And the fourth criterion, criterion C4, that allows to pass from a two-zone model to one-zone model, is related to the area that the fire is, um, is taken. In this case, criterion C4 is met when the fire area is too high compared to the floor surface of the compartment. So this fire cannot be considered a localized fire anymore. Usually the limit is set, the limit is set in the 25% of the floor. So when one of these criteria um, is met, we pass from a two-so model, from a one-so model, we have we have gone through this flows over and we have a generalized uh, fire in the compound. These are the basics of the zone models. As we have said before, ozone is one of the most known, and it, but it's only valid for one compartment. As we have seen in all the figures, only one compartment is simulated. To model several compartments or to model a multi-room uh, um, uh, model of a fire, we can use, for example, CFAST, which is also a two-zone fire model, but that can be used for several compartments. CFAST uh, is, um, is developed also by Venice. Here we can see uh, some uh, like images of some uh, um, simulations and other programs that we can find, for example, is the BRIS from New Zealand, that also is a multi-room zone model that includes flame spread, multiple fires, and the possibility of, um, model, of modeling mechanical ventilation. And to end with this section of advanced model, uh, we just need to review the CFD models. The computational fluid dynamics models, known as CFD, uh, are able to give uh, to calculate the variables, for example, the temperature of the gas, that is our objective in this section, to obtain this temperature of the gas at any time and at any point in the compartment. Uh, well, in this case, the compartment is divided into uh, a grid of small volume elements. Obviously, these type of models are appropriate for more complex geometries because, of course, they are able to provide very detailed solutions, but also require the time input information and usually they require more computing resources, high computational times, etc. Uh, we can say that maybe the most famous of these CFD models is the Fire Dynamics Simulator, FDS, which is um, uh, the, which was developed by the PTT, the Technical Research Center of uh, Finland, in collaboration with the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as we have said before, in the US. Um, FDS uh, solves numerically a form of the Navier stock equations appropriate for low speed thermally driven flow. Today, this is, uh, this is an important that to date about half of the application of the, of the model um, has been for design of smoke handling systems and sprinkle activation studies. The other half consists of residential and industrial fire reconstruction. Here we have a figure of a simulation made with FDS of um, it is, in this case we have like a um, market that we can find in the city of Valencia and a simulation of a fire of a fire happening there. Other type of um, CFD models that we can find, for example, is CPH from the UK. Again, a general purpose CFD software that can be applied for fire simulations and, and explosions. Well, so once we have finished with the view of the different uh, five models that will cover the, the first part or the first step of um, modeling structures in fire, the fire modeling, we can move to the next steps, which were thermal analysis and structural analysis. In order to accomplish these two analyses in a good way, we need to define properly the heat transfer model and the mechanical model. To review these two sections, I leave you with my colleague, uh, Dr. Vicente Albero. 
Thank you very much, uh, Carmen, for this uh, very nice and uh, very comprehensive presentation about fire modeling. So I'm going to make uh, Vicente uh, presenter for the second part of this uh, presentation. So the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Carmen, for your introduction and the explanation of the fire model. And Carmen explained the way to to, to define the, the fire for structural analysis from the easiest way using time temperature, nominal time temperature curves to the most complex way using CFD models. Now uh, I'm going to show you this uh, second and third step to conclude the, the analysis of structures in fire, which is the thermal analysis and the structural analysis. In the thermal analysis, we are going to use uh, as an input data, the results from the fire model. And our objective will be to, to obtain the, the temperatures into the structural elements. So let's go with the third chapter about the heat transfer model. And first we have a look on the heat transfer equation. Yes, so we have here the heat transfer equation with partial derivatives of temperature in its direction depending on the the dimension the, the dimensions of our structural member and we have also three parameters from material three thermal properties of the material the conductivity the specific heat and uh, i'm sorry the density and the specific heat also we have the heat source that usually will be equal zero and the deri derivative of temperature in time so uh, when we work with this equation, we have two different problems. The steady state problem, uh, when the derivative of temperature on time equals zero, this is the problem for long-term heat transfer uh, analysis, and the transient state problem, when uh, the derivative of temperature in time is not equal to zero. In fire, we always uh, have in this second uh, equation in this second problem because the increase on the temperature from fire is very fast and we cannot assume that derivative of temperature in time equals zero. In order to, to solve the equation, we need also the definition of some boundaries. Uh, the, these boundaries are referred here as the input heat flux equals the conductivity of the, of the material on the exposed surface and derivative of temperature in its direction and this input heat flux comes from two different sources from convection using the newton's law the convection coefficient and the difference between temperature on the hot gases surrounding the structure and on the the temperature on the surface and the heat from radiation uh, using this stefan bochman equation with form factor the emissivity of fire the emissivity of the with the material on the surface, Stefan Boltzmann constant, and the difference of temperature at the fourth power between the radiation source and the temperature on the surface. Here, on the temperature on the hot gases and on the radiation source, this is the input of our heat transfer model that comes from the fire modeling that explained uh, Carmen. And an important uh, a dimensional number uh, to analyze heat transfer problems is the beyond number. The beyond number relates the convection coefficient with the conductivity of the material and the effective length that for bidimensional elements, this effective length equals the area, the cross-section area of the element over the exposed perimeter. Problems with beyond number lower than 0 0.1 means that the conductivity of the material is, is much more higher than the convection and we can assume constant temperature on the structural element. On the other hand, problems with beyond number higher than 0 0.1, we have not done this assumption. If we compare two very common structural elements, a reinforced concrete uh, cross-section for beam or column, with a steel cross-section using the same convection coefficient that we will define in following slides, using 
very different conductivity because we will explain the, the difference on the thermal properties of the elements, but conductivity in steel is much is higher than in concrete. And also with a very different effective length because the steel beams has a high exposed perimeter for the same cross section area and reinforced concrete elements are massive with lower exposed perimeter. We obtain uh, very, very different values of the beam number. In this case, in, in, for steel structures, we have a value much more lower than 0 0.1. And we can conclude that for steel structures, uh, the temperature into the structural element is constant. We call this problem the zero dimensional problem because we are assuming only one point for the, the whole cross section with only one temperature. But for concrete, reinforced concrete cross sections, the beam number uh, uh, is higher than 0 0.1 and we cannot assume this constant temperature. Yeah. So let's move to the steel, the analysis of heat transfer on steel structures and using the, assum the assumption uh, detailed before, using the, the constant temperature on the steel cross section, we can use just the energy balance equation to obtain the evolution of the temperature into the, the structural element. This is the energy balance equation. On the left part of the equation, we have the input heat flux and the lateral uh, surface. This is the input energy. And on the right side, we have the energy stored by the material, the volume, density, specific heat, and variation of temperature on time. Usually, still structural elements are prismatic uh, with same cross section along the length. So we can divide this equation by the length. And this parameter, instead of being the lateral area, is just the perimeter, the exposed perimeter, and the volume is just the cross-section area, dividing the whole equation by the length. So using this energy balance equation, we have uh, an equation to obtain the, the variation on, of the steel temperature. Depending on properties of the material, density and specific heat, the input heat flux, of course, the step time, and this is a key factor for the evolution of the temperature into a steel structure, which is the section factor. Uh, defined as the exposed perimeter over the cross-section area. In, uh, indeed, Eurocode 3 in part, uh, part 1-2, this is the Eurocode for steel structures, and part 1-2 is for the fire design. Eurocode 3 provides an equation based on the previous energy balance equation to obtain the temperature on the steel elements. Here in the input heat flux, heat flux we have the convection and the radiation. Uh, when we are using the standard fire curve, the simplest way to, to define the fire, the convection coefficient is defined by Eurocode 1 and 1, 2 as 25 watts over square meter Kelvin. Uh, the emissivity of fire equals one, the emissivity of carbon steel equals 0 0.7. And here we have the, the difference between the temperature on the gas, on the radiation source and on the steel. We can observe here that this equation is an implicit equation because its temperature depends on the previous temperature of the steel. So Eurocode 3 suggests to, to obtain accurate results a step time lower than five seconds. We plot the results on the steel temperature using the, the previous equation. We, we can obtain this plot. This is the, the standard fire curve. And this is the evolution on the temperature in, in a steel member totally exposed to fire. We can observe that 500, 600 degrees are reached after just 10, 15 minutes of fire exposure. That is relatively low. Uh, we uh, observed previously that the key factor, the section factor is here in the Eurocode 3 equation. So changing the section factor, we can change the temperature evolution on the steel cross section. Common values for totally exposed steel elements are from 100 to 400. But uh, when we are uh, analyzing steel structures 
partially embedded into, for example, concrete slabs. We have just the lower flames exposed to fire, and the the section factor drops uh, significantly. With this new section factor, we can observe here that the steel temperature with this new section factor uh, increases uh, not as rapid as the previous one, and 500, 600 degrees Celsius are reached after 40, 50 minutes of fire exposure. And additionally, in Eurocode 3 provides an equation for a passive protection on, on, on steel structures when we are protecting the, the steel element using gypsum, for example, gypsum plus terminal wool or perlit or vermiculite. This new equation depends not only on the properties of the steel, which is the subscript A, but also on the properties of the protection material with pro uh, subscript P. In this case, we have the conductivity of the protection material, the thickness of the protection material, and this factor with, which relates the specific heat density of the protection material and on the steel. Again, this equation is an implicit equation that depends on the previous temperature on the steel, and Eurocore 3 suggests a step time lower than 30 seconds. Here we have the comparison of the steel temperature evolution of an unprotected steel element and a protected one. We can observe that 500, 600 degrees are reached after more than 60 minutes of fire exposure. Which is, so these are very common way to protect the, the steel structures because the delay on the steel rise is very, very high from 10, 15 minutes to more than 60 minutes using this passive protection. So this is a common common way to, to protect steel structures and affects main, mainly on the heat transfer model because the, the increase on the temperatures are not as fast as with un, unprotected steel cross sections. And if we talk about concrete structures, uh, we analyze using the beyond numbers that in this case, we cannot assume constant temperature. And usually we need to solve the, the heat transfer equation for unidimension, the unidimensional problem for walls or slab, or, or the bidimensional pr problem in case of beams or columns. Although Eurocode 2, in part one two on the annex A, you go to for concrete structures, part one two for the analysis in fire, provides the solution of the previous heat transfer equations uh, for a certain uh, cross section dimension. For example, this is the graph provided by Eurocode code two part one two on the annex A for slabs. In this case, we have, depending on the slab, uh, on, the, on the depth on the slab, we have the, the temperature under different uh, times of standard fire exposure. For example, at 20 millimeters depth, we have 350 approximately degrees Celsius after 30 minutes of fire exposure and uh, 500 uh, Celsius after 60, min 60 minutes of fire exposure. And these other graphs are for bidimensional cross section. In this case, we have graphs for reinforced con concrete cross section with 300 millimeters height and 160 millimeters width. Here we have only one corner. We can observe from zero to the half weight, uh, half uh, height, 150, and the half width from zero to 80 millimeters. And the location of each isotherm after 60 minutes of exposure from the from four, the four sides to the standard fire core. And same graph with the isotherms, but after 90 minutes of fire exposure. In any case, the, the graphs provided by Eurocode 2 are limited, only some dimensions and under specific um, uh, parameters are available. And sometimes we will need a, a finite element model using like software like Diana to obtain the temperatures into the concrete element. It's important to notice that Wickstrom in 80s developed 
developed some equations to obtain the temperatures into uh, concrete structures. And these equations are an analytical equations to obtain the, the previous graphs from Eurocons. We can use to, to obtain automatically the, the previous graphs because sometimes graphs are not very useful to, to use in automatic calculations. This is the equation provided by Wickstrom for, for a unidimensional problem. Here we have the temperature from fire, the, the, the coefficient for the depth, the X depth, uh, depending on the, the time exposure in hours and the depth on the X direction. And this is the equation for bidimensional problems that includes also the, the coefficient on the Y direction. Again, this equation has limitations, are only available for standard fire and in certain, under certain dimensions. So uh, sometimes we will need the, the development of an advanced finite element model to analyze uh, concrete cross sections. And in order to define this advanced model, we need to define the thermal properties of each material. First, about steel, Eurocode 3, part 1, 2 provides the, the, the steel properties, the steel thermal properties. We can define a constant value of density, uh, a non constant value of conductivity, variable at elevated temperatures with a value at room, at room temperature. Uh, approximately 55 watts over a meter Kelvin, uh, decay on this conductivity up to 800 degrees Celsius and a constant value over this, this temperature. And, and a specific heat for steel, approximately um, of 600 joules over kilo Kelvin, but with a heavy peak at 635 degrees Celsius, due to the change on the crystal structure of the steel, because this, this peak means the energy consumption on the change on, this, on the strict, uh, st crystal structure of the steel. And about concrete, uh, Eurocode 2 part 1, 2 provides values for conductivity. Here we have uh, the definition of the conductivity through an upper and lower limit. Uh, we know that the next version of Eurocode 2 part 1, 2 will provide a uh, more specific definition only with one curve. But now we have this, this definition and we can define the conductivity between these two limits. Uh, these limits are usually related with the type of aggregate because it's not the same conductivity for different aggregate types. Constant value of density, 2,300 kilos over cubic meter, and the definition of the specific heat. This is a very interesting parameter for concrete because this specific heat at 100 degrees Celsius shows a peak depending on the moisture content. This peak uh, means the, the energy uh, consumed on the water vaporization of concrete. Yeah? So no peak for 0% of moisture content and 2000 joules over kilo Kelvin for 3% of moisture content. Uh, Eurocode 4 for, for concrete steel structures defines uh, a, a div is the same definition of the specific heat for concrete, but with available values higher than 3%, I think up to 10% in Eurocode 4. In any case, uh, this definition of the spe specific heat means uh, an implicit uh, model of concrete that takes into account the concrete and water. It's like a wet concrete. This is different. This definition on Eurocoach is different uh, from US because on the US standards, the definition of concrete is, is done by a multi-physics uh, model with concrete and uh, water separately. Yeah. The, the peak on the specific heat is very important when we are trying to validate the uh, advanced uh, thermal models because real thermocouples, uh, when we have real thermocouples on concrete, usually uh, the behavior is like this uh, black line. When the thermocouple reaches 100 degrees Celsius, a plateau appears uh, because the, the energy is, is being used on the water vaporization. And when 
concrete at this position is totally dry, the temperature increases um, again. So the, the definition of this plateau depends on the height of this peak, on the specific heat, and not always is easy to, to, to model. Yeah? And about boundary conditions, Eurocode 1, part 1, so about actions in fire, defines the convection coefficient for the unexposed surfaces equals 4 watts over square meter Kelvin, 25 for the standard fire curve, 35 if we are using models for natural fire, and 50 for hydrocarbon fire. And about uh, radiation, a value of 1 for the emissivity of fire, and the emissivity of the exposed surface depends on the material, 0 0.7 for carbon and steel and concrete. And for example, Europe 3 also provides a value for stainless steel equals 0 0.4. It's important to take into account this value because if we compare the energy, the, the heat flux from fire coming from the convection, from the hot surrounding gases, and the energy from radiation, the amount of energy from radiation uh, it's higher than from convection. So a lower value on the emissivity may be important for, to, to, to protect the, the structural elements or to, to obtain a, a lower values of temperature into the element. So stainless, this lower value of stainless steel comes from the brightness of the surface of, of the stainless steel. And this is a good material you know, for fire purposes. And um, finally, uh, we are going to talk about the mechanical model. In this case, we are going to use the temperature from the heat transfer model to analyze the, the structural element from a mechanical point of view. First, we are going to talk about mechanical properties at elevated temperature for steel and concrete uh, to, to be used into advanced models. So about a steel, uh, first, we need to define the, the strain components. We have the common component of the strain at room temperature, which is the mechanical strain component, the stress-related strain. But at elevated temperature, we have an additional strain, the thermal strain, that comes from the elongation, the dilatation of the material. That could be important uh, for restrained elements because when boundary conditions restrain the free elongation of the element, uh, an additional compression may occur due to this thermal restraint. And also steel uh, has a third component of, on the strain, the creep component, that usually is not significant at room temperature, but becomes relevant over 400, 500 degrees Celsius. We can observe here from bibliography some the, the evolution of the strain at different stress levels and temperatures. And we can observe that for temperatures over or 500 degrees, the strain increases very, very fast, even for lower values of the stress field. Yeah? In any case, the Eurocode 3 model, the stress strain Eurocode 3 model at elevated temperatures in part 1 2 includes the mechanical strain and the creep strain. The creep strain are inclu is included into the Eurocode 3 part 1 2 model. And thermal strain always uh, is defined separately. And Euro 3 also provides some reduction coefficients for the gel strength on the steel and the elastic modulus. We can observe here that the gel strength remains without reduction for temperatures lower 300, 400 degrees Celsius. And the remaining strength over 700 degrees Celsius is lower than 10%. So the strength drops dramatically between 400 and 700 degrees Celsius. The co reduction coefficients are slightly different for hot roll steel grade than for cold form. Yeah. And if we use these reduction coefficients and the stress strain definition, take into account the creep strain, we can plot using, for example, an elastoplastic model, we can plot the, the behavior the stress strain behavior of the steel at different temperatures. We can observe here an important decrease on the strength on the gel stress, gel strength, sorry, an important decrease on the stiffness on the elastic modulus, but also an increase on the ductility, an increase on the uh, strain at gel stress. Yeah, we can observe here 
a strain of 0.2% at room temperature and a strain approximately of 2% of 700 degrees Celsius. And about concrete, uh, the strain components for concrete, we have the, the same strain components, mechanical, thermal, and creep strain. But for concrete, we have an additional one, the transient thermal strain that occurs only during the first heating of concrete over 600 degrees Celsius by the expansion of the cement phase. Eurocode 2.12, the stress strain definition in, for fire includes the mechanical, creep, and transient thermal strain. The, the three components. Thermal strain, again, is defined separately. And we will see the definition of thermal strain in following slides. So the, the, the Euro code includes mechanical creep and transient strain. And also a definition of reduction coefficients for characteristic strength, uh, different values for calcareous or siliceous aggregate. And also, th this is the table, this is the table from Eurocode 2 part 1 2, a uh, variation on the ultimate strain and on the strain at characteristic strength, for example, at room temperature, a strain of uh, 0.25% and a strain of 2.5% over 1000 uh, degrees Celsius. Using these reduction coefficients and the definition of the stress strain, uh, model, we can uh, plot this stress strain behavior of the concrete at elevated temperatures. We observe again a reduction on the uh, characteristic strength, a reduction on the stiffness with lower initial elastic modulus, and an increase on the ultimate strain and on the strain at characteristic strain. So the trend for steel and concrete is more or less the same lower strength, lower stiffness, and higher ductility. This is the trend at elevated temperatures. This model is useful for compression, and usually uh, the resistance intention is then neglected, but uh, Eurocode 2 part 1 2 also provides reduction coefficients for tension, but usually it's, it's neglected. And about concrete, it's important to notice also the effect of the spoiling. Spalling is an explosive behavior of concrete uh, on the exposed surface that comes from the high pore pressure due to the, the water vapor. Yeah? This spalling, this concrete spalling, is related to, to high moisture content because it comes from the, the, the pressure from the water vapor, is related to rapid heating rates from, from fire, and is also related with the high strength of concrete and uh, include this effect, this polling effect, into advanced finite element models is very, very difficult because we require a model with uh, removing some elements or some strange strategies. So how to manage with the, this, this spalling? Your code two suggests to avoid the spalling this, this way, yes, avoiding the, the spalling. And uh, for normal concrete, limiting the moisture content for values lower than 3%, because with this moisture content, the, the spalling unlikely occurs. And for when we are uh, analyzing high elements with high strength concrete, Eurocode 2 assumes that uh, spalling may occur and uh, provides uh, some strategies to prevent the effect of the spalling, using, for example, frame formant mess near the surface with 15 millimeters cover, or the usage of polypropylene fibers. Uh, because polypropylene fibers melt at elevated temperature and creates a, a net to, 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 yeah, to, to allow the water vapor to escape from the concrete element and obtain lower pore pressure. Yeah. About thermal expansion, as we explained before, the the thermal expansion is defined separately from the mechanical, and mechanical or creep strain, but Eurocode 2 and Eurocode 3 define the, the thermal elongation, not the thermal expansion, the thermal elongation. And usually the finite element models require the thermal expansion, which is only the, the thermal elongation over the difference in temperature. We have here the, the values for, for thermal expansion for concrete and steel. 
different values again for silicious and calcareous fibers. And about mechanical action in fire, just a, a quick look. Uh, when we are assessing structures in fire, the action must be combined using the accidental design, design situation, situation in accordance with your code zero. We are not using safety factors for actions in this design situa situation dead loads all dead loads and the main live load with the frequent value of the quasi permanent value depending on its national annex for example in, in spain we use the frequent value and the rest of the live loads using the quasi permanent uh, combination factor yeah. is a way to combine the actions to analyze the structures in fire um, an important thing to to take into account is the different assessment strategies when we are analyzing structures, uh, mechanic structures in fire. Yeah, usually uh, we use this the, the the member analysis. Yeah, it's just obtaining the fire resistance of each member of the structure, its its beam, its column, its floor, separately, obtaining the fire resistance in terms of fire resistance time or in terms of strength in fire and comparing this resistance of each member with the requirement done by its national standard. For example, in case of Spain, we have a requirement for um, residential buildings with uh, evacuation height lower than 15 meters, a requirement of 60 minutes of fire exposure. And for commercial or industrial uh, buildings, the requirement uh, may come from no requirements, zero minutes to 120 minutes, depending on the fire risk and the availability of fire fighting facilities, for example. So this is the most common way to analyze structures, to analyze, to mechanically analyze structures in fire. And Eurocode uh, provides many prescriptions to use this, this approach, yeah, like tabulated data for concrete structures and other simplified models like the isotherm 500 degrees or the critical temperature. But even using this simple approach, yeah, sometimes we need the usage of uh, finite element advanced models like Diana, because uh, some cross sections, some innovative materials, innovative cross sections are out of the, the scope of the simplified models provided by Eurocodes. And we, have, we, we need finite element models to analyze the, the behavior of these elements in fire. And if we use the performance-based design that explained Carmen uh, on the beginning of the presentation using localized fire, natural fire, uh, we need also advanced models to, to assess the structure because maybe the, the fire only affects some elements of the structure, just one beam or one column. And the local collapse of, of these elements, uh, maybe, is not the the whole collapse of the of the building and then we need an advanced model to 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 do to do this this analysis this complex analysis because it's much more complex than the the usage of prescriptive rules now uh, we want to show you uh, some simplified models the, the the most important from our point of view uh, to be used on steel and concrete structures using this this first approach of the member analysis and for concrete structures, uh, the most common simplified model is the tabulated data model uh, provided by Eurocode 2512. Just, uh, it's, it's just an uh, analysis of the dimensions of columns or walls uh, and the axis distance from the exposed surface to the uh, reinforcing bar, depending on different parameters, the slenderness, the, the degree of automatization, and the, the, the face is exposed to, 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 to fire. Right? But it's quite easy to obtain the, the standard fire resistance using this simplified model, tabulated data. Another simplified model for concrete structures is the 500 degree Celsius isotherm, uh, useful for walls, uh, for slabs, I'm sorry, and for um, beams. And this method, uh, are based on the analysis, on the plastic analysis of, of the concrete cross section uh, using the common compression block and the reinforcing bars in tension, but take into account some assumptions that uh, concrete over 500 uh, degrees is removed. So we need to 
to locate the 500 degrees Celsius isotherm. So we will need the, the usage of, for example, the, the graphs from Eurocode SUPA 1 to Annex A, or the usage of Wickstrom equations, or even our own finite element model uh, developed in Diana. And also, uh, the, the other assumption is that the reinforcing bars, the strength of the reinforcing bar are, is reduced from the elevated temperature effect. So we will need the, the temperature on the reinforcing bar location yeah, to, to perform the plastic uh, bending analysis. Yeah? So we can obtain the, the plastic bending moment resistance under any exposure from, from fire. And for uh, steel structures, the most common simplified model is the critical temperature, useful only for members under tension and bending. It's not useful for packling for instability members. And uh, the critical temperature is the definition of a temperature uh, that uh, means the collapse of the, the steel element depending on the degree of utilization, just on the degree of utilization. This degree of utilization is defined as the effect of the actions using the, the accidental design situation uh, defined previously, and the resistance of the cross section at, zero, at time zero, this is at room temperature, but using the safety factors for the fire situation. We observe the, the, the critical temperatures for different values of um, degree of utilization, we can observe that critical goes from 500 to 700 degrees Celsius. This is the reason why uh, in the first slides about the temperature evolution on steel, I was focused on the range between 500, 600 degrees Celsius, because it's the range uh, of the usage of the critical temperature. Yeah. So uh, remember that uh, an exposed, uh, totally exposed steel elements uh, reach this critical temperature after 10, 15 minutes of fire exposure to a standard fire core um, and protected steel elements may delay this, this time to the, the critical temperature time to, to more than 60 minutes. And finally, I want to show you the, some examples of the usage of advanced models to, to assess structural elements. In this first case, uh, we assess uh, com composite steel concrete columns in fire. This, this column is called the concrete field steel tubular column. And we assess also the usage of innovative cross section and uh, with uh, a steel column or a, another tube embedded into the concrete field. So uh, no available simplified models uh, in Eurocode 4, in this case, for con composite steel concrete columns for this innovative cross section. So we needed the, the, the assessment of the elements through a finite element model. So we're going to show here that the, 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 the behavior of the simple uh, column is the uh, first elongation of the steel tube up to some temperature is reached on the outer tube and the general buckling of the column occurs. But when we are mm, placing uh, an, an additional steel element uh, in field, uh, on the concrete in field, this buckling uh, is not the end of the, of the behavior because the, the, the steel column maintains the, the load up to higher time of fire exposure, yeah, up to 60 or 70 minutes of fire exposure, depending on the design of the column. And also, uh, we done an analysis of slim floor uh, beams from Arcelor uh, using a finite element advanced model. And we compare the, the evolution and the bending resistance of this composite cross section, but using stainless steel on the lower steel plate. In this case, the usage of this advanced material or this uh, innovative material is not uh, is out of the scope of the simplified models available in Eurocodes, and we use a, an advanced finite element model, obtaining a higher value of plastic bending resistance at any fire exposure time after 60, 90, 120 time uh, exposure time. And um, uh, 
you have here some references that we use to to design these slides so it could be useful and this is the end of the presentation thank you very much for your attention thank you very much Jean Globe, for your invitation and we are free for to answer our questions well, thank you very much, uh, Vicente, and thanks also to Carmen for this very uh, nice uh, presentation, very comprehensive uh, presentation. You you covered quite uh, quite a lot, so uh, a lot of uh, information for us to to process.